Oh. So, good afternoon and welcome to the 61st faculty lectureship at NDSU presented this year by Dr. Paul Carson. I am Mark Harvey. I am professor of history and head of the Department of History, Philosophy and Religious Studies. In 2008, I was honored as that year's recipient of the faculty lectureship. I know what a wonderful occasion this is for the individual and for students, staff, relatives, and friends from the community. Welcome to all of you. A few words about today's program and format. After the introductions, Dr. Carson will speak for about 40 minutes. We will then have some time for questions, after which uh, Provost Fitzgerald will make some remarks. A reception in the gallery over there, out the door and over in the corner of the union will follow, where you're all invited to enjoy cake and coffee and more conversation. The faculty lectureship is one of the most prestigious awards given to faculty at NDSU. The award was first conferred in 1957 when Professor W.C. Whitman spoke about grass on the prairies. And just to give you a few other of the titles and topics, in 1960, Professor A.G. Hill uh, told his audience about the new look in mathematics. Lecturers in subsequent years have spoken on such varied topics as Shakespeare, world hunger, magic, atomic energy, quantum chemistry, wetlands, climate change, fetal development, witchcraft and folk medicine, and one called the fear of the future, a healthy emotion. My own talk in 2008 was called Wild About Wilderness, a historian's journey into nature's past. And in 2013, Dr. Joanne Miller of the School of Music brought her entire choir along to lecture on the conductor's art. The faculty lectureship recognizes a high level of achievement in teaching, scholarship, and service. This year, Dr. Cheryl Wackenheim, Professor of Agribusiness and Applied Economics, is the second finalist. And I invite you to join me in recognizing her work. This year's recipient, Dr. Paul Carson, has impressive accomplishments in teaching, scholarship, and service. As many of us know, Dr. Carson's recent research and service has been dominated by the COVID-19 pandemic, during which he has been called on to advise the university on its health and safety protocols and to advise the uh, North Dakota University system and the state of North Dakota on pandemic related challenges and concerns. To provide a fuller description of Dr. Carson's impressive achievements, I would now like to call on Dr. Chuck Peterson, Dean of the College of Health Professions. Thank you, Mark. Well, being Dean of the College of Health Professions, it's just an honor for me to introduce Dr. Carson for this most prestigious award. Dr. Paul Carson is a physician who is board certified in the fields of internal medicine and infectious diseases. He is a professor of practice in the NDSU Department of Public Health, where he teaches on the management of infectious diseases in the Master of Public Health graduate program. In 2020, he received NDSU's College of Health Professions Mary J. Berg Award for Excellence in Teaching. In 2015, Dr. Far Carson founded the NDSU Center for Immunization Research and Education, which he and his team have received over $8 million in funding to address barriers to vaccination 
and made efforts to increase vaccination, acceptance, and uptake. During the pandemic, he has been a regular consultant to the North Dakota Department of Health and served on Governor Bergen's task force to address the pandemic response in North Dakota. Prior to coming to NDSU in 2013, he worked at Sanford Health as a clinician caring for patients with infectious diseases. While at Sanford Health, he had held various roles, including chair of the Department of Infectious Diseases, director of the clinical research, associate director of the internal medicine residency program, and chief quality officer. He also is a professor in the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences, where he has educated medical students and residents for most of his career. Dr. Carson considers his greatest accomplishment, marrying his wife of 37 years, Janine, his medical school classmate, who apparently always ranked higher than him in their class, and having some share of raising four wonderful children, Graham, Grace, Madeline, and Therese. Dr. Carson is presenting the NDSU fac faculty lectureship today entitled, Two Years on the Pandemic Frontline, Lessons Learned and Reflections for the Academy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Carson. Well, I want to thank you, Dean Peterson, for that very kind introduction. <clears throat> I'm especially grateful for having you to be able to introduce me, uh, given your announced retirement after an exemplary career here at NDSU, uh, helping, I think, our College of Health Professions to become such an outstanding center of teaching and research. Um, I'm especially grateful to Dean Peterson because it was he, along with our first department chair, Dr. Donald Warren, who were really instrumental in moving me, maybe even prying me from the clinical world to join NDSU in 2013 in this newly formed public health program. I can honestly, see, I can honestly say that that's really been one of the most gratifying decisions and um, changes in my career uh, that I could have ever experienced. I really wanna thank my colleagues in the Department of Public Health for nominating me for this award and the awards committee for granting me this award. I'm truly grateful and I'm truly humbled. And I want to congratulate Dr. Walkenheim for her nomination and recognition for this award. And I think had it not been such an extraordinary last couple of years with this historic pandemic, it is almost certain that you'd be delivering this address. I'm also grateful to NDSU and the awards committee for encouraging the recipient to invite their family to this event. <clears throat> Many of my family and extended family are here today. It's really a lovely opportunity that I get to share this time in recognition with my family who have been so supportive and patient and helpful to me as I've tried to navigate my way through this pandemic and trying to help the state of North Dakota. It's very special to me that my four children are here, Graham, Grace, Madeline, and Therese, uh, who are scattered at, uh, around different locations around the country, and they're all able to be here today with me. Um, I'm especially grateful to my wife, Janine, who's uh, been a sounding board and counselor for me throughout this pandemic and extraordinarily patient with my marriage to my work uh, much of the last two years. The title of the talk is Two Years on a Pandemic Frontline, which immediately calls for a bit of an apology because <clears throat> I worked in various capacities around the COVID pandemic, but was definitely not among the true people working on the front line. <clears throat> a lot of those people are here today and listening on Zoom. These were our nurses, therapists, pharmacists, doctors, even our teachers and other essential workers that had to stay out in the public uh, forum doing their job. And that was not me. Most of my work was safely in my den behind a computer screen, most of the time not in my pajamas. Um, and I wanna acknowledge all those people, especially my colleagues in healthcare, <clears throat> um, that cared for patients often under extremely difficult conditions these last two years. As I said, several of those colleagues who are here today are listening over Zoom and they deserve a very heartfelt thanks. 
So um, let me move to the topic, which is, is two years on a pandemic frontline, lessons learned and reflections for the academy. So just a brief outline of what I hope to go over uh, with you shortly today is what our work has been uh, prior to the pandemic in our Center for Immunization Research and Education, or CIRI, how the COVID-19 pandemic greatly amplified our work, <clears throat> and then to talk more in depth about one of the things that our work is frequently about, which is vaccine hesitancy, or some people might flip that to say issues with vaccine confidence. And I wanna explore with you some of the roots of the declining confidence in vaccines. And then try and uh, touch on how this seemed to become a perfect storm for polarization. Um, and then uh, finish with reflecting with you on some of the lessons that I feel like I've learned. I think some of my public health colleagues have learned and how some of those lessons I think may have broader applicability to the uh, overall university community. So we in public health are frequently about trying to move upstream on problems. <clears throat> Um, we want, uh, as Louis Pasteur said, it's much better to prevent a problem than to treat it after it occurs. And speaking about infectious diseases in particular. I, I had to learn this lesson, I think, a bit the hard way um, through the, this pandemic and even before. And I think I'm finally getting to the way we're really supposed to think about it in public health. And I want to reflect on that with you. So first a bit about our work and how the pandemic kind of amplified or magnified that work. If you look at vaccine preventable diseases, not that far back, um, close to the first half of the 20th century, <laughs> compared um, the morbidity and the mortality of those diseases compared to what they were then and what they are as recently as uh, 2020 here, you can see this dramatic reductions in these diseases on the low end, a 97% reduction from what we previously experienced. Um, Smallpox has been eradicated from the world, an unbelievable achievement, a disease that plagued the world for millennia. Um, by some estimates, uh, uh, may have killed up to half of uh, the indigenous people of North, uh, Central, and South America. Um, we are on the cusp of eradicating polio from the world. It was narrowed down to two small enclaves in Afghanistan and Pakistan <clears throat> with strong efforts to try and uh, root that out for the second disease to ever be eradicated from the world. It has been eliminated from the Western hemisphere for decades. Um, but therein lies the problem, because if you look at that column to the right there and the percentage decreases, these diseases have for the most part faded from our collective consciousness. Nobody's seen these. <clears throat> um, even if I talk to almost all of my colleagues in healthcare, virtually none of them except maybe my senior partner, Dr. Tite, uh, sitting in the audience with me who taught me much of uh, infectious disease and medicine and medical school, has even seen measles. Um, the only measles I ever saw was on a rotation in Africa in the 1980s. Um, so these diseases have faded from our collective consciousness. I had a conversation with one of my children uh, about this talk and he, so you can guess which one it is, said, um, Dad, you know, I think you probably ought to tell people what, you know, polio and measles does because, like, I really have no clue what polio or measles does to a person. And my son is not a dummy. He's got a graduate degree in engineering. He grew up with two doctors uh, as parents. Um, but that tells you just how um, irrelevant these diseases are to most people's uh, lives. So uh, this creates a problem because now the real or imagined adverse effects of vaccines have um, outgrown the concerns about the diseases that are even meant to prevent in many people's minds. And as such, the World Health Organization has now listed vaccine hesitancy as one of the 10 top global health threats. Um, they keep a list that they update regularly from year to year since 2019. Vaccine hesitancy has been listed as one of the 10 greatest global health threats and remains on that list up to the present time. And that's with good reason. If you look at where we've been uh, in just the recent few years, these diseases that have faded from our collective consciousness are right at our doorstep waiting to get a toehold back in. You may remember just a few years ago, the Disneyland measles outbreak <laughs> um, next door in Minnesota, an outbreak uh, of measles primarily in the new American immigrant population. <clears throat> Uh, a more recent outbreak of measles in primarily Brooklyn, New York, uh, focused a lot on the um, Orthodox Jewish community there. Stunningly, polio is making a comeback. Um, 
polio out, there was a polio outbreak just a few years ago in the Philippines after 19 years of no cases of polio in the Philippines. <clears throat> we had an outbreak here just this month of polio in Israel after years of no cases of polio. And, a, and just last month, an outbreak of polio in Malawi after years of no cases of polio. Um, these, are, these are deeply concerning reversals of gains that uh, have ma been made of a disease that we were on the cusp of eradicating from the world. And so the World Health Organization putting this hesitancy, declining uh, acceptance of vaccinations, I think is an appropriate uh, marker of uh, a global health threat. If we think we're immune from this in places like North Dakota, these are our vaccination rates in several of our lowest vaccinated counties in North Dakota for measles, mumps, and rubella and polio at the end of the fourth quarter of 2021. Now you take a look at some of those and you see rates of 36, 38% for measles, mumps, rubella, and polio. Um, you know, uh, rates in the 50s, 60%. We usually need somewhere between 90 to 95% of the population immune, typically through vaccination um, or prior infection. In this case, it's all vaccination to develop what we call herd immunity, which is uh, where you have enough people in a population immune that the disease can't get a foothold in and spread to, to other people. Um, we are well, well below that in numerous counties in North Dakota and ripe for uh, someone stepping in, a traveler perhaps, uh, with one of these diseases and being able to reintroduce um, these as an epidemic. Oops, wrong way. <clears throat> so when I first came to NDSU uh, in 2013, um, I was uh, asked if I might consider helping to kind of resurrect a vaccine advocacy group that had some people on campus that were working in that and other stakeholders in the community. Um, the people that had been the main stakeholders had moved to other jobs and various uh, um, other things. And I said, you know, I'd be potentially interested in that, but I think I'd rather do it uh, as a, a center in the university that also has an education and research agenda. And so we applied to the State Board of Higher Education to develop a center for immunization research and education, which they granted us in 2015 with the um, expressed notation that we were to never ask the state for any money. So um, we didn't, uh, we've, we've looked for money elsewhere, but um, as we started our center on uh, more or less a shoestring. And one of our first projects that we uh, received a grant for uh, came from the North Dakota Department of Health, where they had been noting uh, steady declines in immunization rates of children entering school. School is the kind of uh, guardian of vaccination for our children. All states have laws and rules about um, vaccination requirements for a child to enter school. And we had substantially declining rates after really being one of the best states in the country. So from about 2012 to 2015, we had become one of the fifth lowest states for uh, vaccination rates in children entering kindergarten. And we were asked to investigate this, study this and, and make recommendations to the Department of Health and to the legislature. Uh, we hired one of my sharpest graduate students, uh, Kylie Hall, who's been with me ever since. She's my right arm, left leg, most of my brain. If anything has been done good from our center, it's almost um, by rights uh, because of Kylie working with me. This was her first project as a project manager. We have actually, I think, uh, Nathan, you were the graduate student on this. And um, who's that? Danny was the other graduate. She's here too. We're the, we're the graduate students on this project. Um, they all did a very deep dive into what, what was behind this. We had an assumption that it was North Dakota's really easy exemption policy. As it turns out, um, that really wasn't the case. The problem actually had more to do with how principals and superintendents of school districts viewed their job of enforcing the century code and the laws that are on the books. And we had a small number that took that very seriously and a greater number that said, I don't want to be the police force for you people in public health. Um, we delivered a white paper to the legislature and the Department of Public Instruction and the Department of Health. Um, Kylie and uh, our grad students got a very nice uh, paper out of this in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. And um, that spotlight got shown, the news picked this up. Uh, we didn't really intend for that, but it helped. Um, and the vaccination rates climbed and we returned in the few years to our, um, our prior higher rates. We next turned our attention to uh, an issue um, that was kind of a was a problem everywhere in the US, which was very low um, human papillomavirus vaccination rates. So HPV is the vaccine that um, is given to prevent 
primarily cervical cancer in women and now increasingly oral pharyngeal cancer in men. And it's one of the few vaccines that prevents a cancer. I mean, it's like an incredible accomplishment, but it's, it's a very hard vaccine to get parents to take. And the reason is, is you're giving a vaccine that's to prevent a sexually transmitted disease and you're trying to give it to children who are age 11 to 13. So you're talking to mom and dad about their little angel, about a future sexually transmitted disease. And it's a very uncomfortable and difficult conversation. <clears throat> and so rates tended to be low. We knew from prior research that uh, the, a person's own physician, their personal physician, had the highest trust about vaccine um, safety information. And there was a lot of misinformation about safety of this vaccine. It's a very safe vaccine, but lots of swirling misinformation. So um, the previous graduate student on this project had graduated. So another one of our really sharp students, Danny Finnick, um, became the project manager over this. Next project where we received a CDC grant. And we went out to, I think it was 100 or 120 clinics across the state <clears throat> where we delivered sort of state-of-the-art um, information to these primary care providers on safety, efficacy, necessity of this vaccine. And more importantly, I think, starting to talk about how do you have these difficult conversations? What's the best evidence of how to approach these difficult conversations? And um, I, I'd like us to take all the credit. I don't think we can because there were some other things going on at the time, but it really seemed to help. So this was the state of uh, immunization rates in uh, the U.S., um, and most of the country had very low, you know, the dark blue at this axis is a bit flipped here, but on the right, less than 52% um, uh, immunization rates for most of the states, a few a little better than that on the, on the Northeast. And this is about when we started our project. But Danny, you know, brought these vaccine champions that we had trained to go around the state. And lo and behold, things started to get a little bit better the next year. And then they got a little bit better than that the next year. And by 2020, we were the second best state in the country for HPV immunization. We were behind... We were second only to Rhode Island, which had mandated it for school entry, which was kind of unheard of. They tried to do that in Texas, and it was like pitchforks and torches at the legislature. So, um, but we didn't have to do that, and and we we achieved really high uh, immunization rates in North Dakota, which is still holding pretty well. We're we're very proud of that fact. Our next uh, kind of project in Siri um, had to do with trying to take that information about these difficult conversations and do a deeper dive into it, and so. We got a, a small grant from the Otto Bremer Foundation and uh, that we got a matching grant from the Dakota Medical Foundation to try and partner up with a group of uh, pediatricians. This was a Sanford group of pediatricians in the Moorhead Clinic, engaged group of really smart, uh, um, uh, very engaged doctors and nurse practitioners. And Kylie was a project manager on this one. And we brought in Lauren Dibson, one of our graduate students at the time. And we did this intensive training on overall vaccine safety, efficacy, and necessity, and then intensive training on how you have these difficult conversations. And there was two different kind of competing, uh, you know, modes of doing that. And we had them kind of try both. And we took lessons to learn, like, what works? What's the best way to approach this? We learned a lot from this uh, project. We learned that <clears throat> uh, even, even if you have smart, well-trained, engaged doctors and nurse practitioners, they all hate these conflict-ridden uh, conversations. They said they'd get knots in their stomach before they'd go in. They almost kind of hoped the uh, patient and the family wouldn't show up in the office that day. And, you know, they're, they're well-trained in vaccines and diseases and so on, but they're not well-trained in conflict management or, or difficult conversations. We also learned um, Lauren shadowed these uh, doctors for like, I don't know, three or four months and, you know, was coaching them on these different communication styles. And they'd come out of the office like, I didn't do so good that she, how, how should I have said that? How should, she became, you know, she, Laura and I pick on her, she looks like she's 12 years old, but she became the expert in like, uh, you know, how do you communicate about this? And, uh, and, and it, was, it was a long process for these doctors to be able to change their, their habits and patterns. So that was sort of our next aha moment of, of moving things upstream. And it really was Lauren's aha moment of moving things upstream. Lauren thought like, if we're trying to change doctors, you know, uh, ways that they approach things, we're, we're probably a little late here. And, and Lauren had the idea as a graduate student to start studying how this is being done in medical school, pharmacy school, nursing school, identified gaps, issues, problems with the curriculum. And Lauren then got hired on as one of our uh, project managers to, and she's working in a number of different ways, but is brought on 
now to um, uh, she's she's helped develop a curriculum for all of these pre-professional schools to try and get the get people to have more comfort with the way we approach these difficult conversations before they're out in the field, kind of you know forming their their habits. So now it kind of comes to what did the COVID nineteen pandemic you know do for our Department of Public Health and our center? So it really amplified things. And this is a few of the things uh, it did for us. It, first, it really made direct applicability to our students on all the things we were teaching on epidemiology and infectious diseases. We had all these real world examples every day in our face, in the papers to be able to teach to. And I can tell you when you have students um, who see that what they are learning has really uh, real world applicability for a thing that really matters, you have a very engaged student body. So one of my first lessons for the broader, you know, my broader uh, university colleagues is, I think there's a lot of lessons that this pandemic can be used for marketing and communications and psychology and statistics and uh, a number of other fields. And I'm sure many of you are doing this already, but it really helps because everybody's lived through this. We've probably got a good five, six, seven, eight years where the, you know, people who went through this are gonna remember and see the applicability of these things. The other thing uh, it, it certainly did was uh, we were asked to assist the health department and the North Dakota government on a number of different fronts. So um, we, were, we were providing technical briefs on all these different questions. Do masks work? Is there asymptomatic transmission? Um, does hydroxychloroquine treat, you know, COVID and so on. We were, when nobody knew the answers to these, we, our students were stepping up and doing the research uh, reviews and providing technical briefs to the governor's office and the health department. Um, we, um, I was asked to serve as Dean Peterson set on a number of different task forces for the county, for the state, for the university system and so on. We started to receive a number of different grants. I mean, money started pouring into the states for these from the CDC and also through the CARES Act and other things. And we were the beneficiaries of a lot of grants to address the various problems uh, around mitigating the pandemic and around vaccine hesitancy. And this has led to just a plethora of really wonderful collaborations with a, a number of colleagues here at NDSU, many of them who are here today uh, with pharmacy. Uh, we'd had some prior work, myself and Dr. Elizabeth Scoy, and, and that's just really dovetailed nicely into what the, the work we're doing now around COVID. Uh, a lot more work now with nursing colleagues. Um, anthropology, a new thing for me. Uh, um, Dr. Ellen Rubenstein's just been an uh, excellent colleague sort of studying how we do things and helping us to think about these in a very different way. Communications, Dr. Crawford uh, helping with us. And, and we now have partners with uh, HNES, Athletics, uh, Scott Wilkins here. We've, we've done a bunch of things together. Tribal populations are... Our NDSU American Indian Public Health Resource Center has been a really great partner. We've, we have collaborations with UND, the health department. And we've done things with Sanford Health and Essential Health as well. So uh, our work has uh, is really expanded. Kylie has now moved up to being an operations director of our center and she oversees now a number of different project managers aimed at a variety of facets, uh, facets of this uh, pandemic and around the issues of vaccine hesitancy. I would love to tell you in more details if we visit over cake and coffee, I'll, I'd be happy to do that. I wanna spend the rest of the time we have together talking about what our work is, one of the areas our work is focused on, which is vaccine hesitancy or reframed if you want, vaccine confidence. What are the roots of that? Um, and uh, I, I put out my little book list. These are a number of books. This is my reading list over the last uh, couple of years uh, 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 that are researchers that have, um, uh, or people that have compiled, compiled research that have really helped me think through this. I find myself reading much more behavioral psychology and social psychology than I do infectious diseases now, which is uh, more appropriate for, for this type of work. But I, if you're interested in this sort of thing, these are all out, outstanding books. So uh, to the roots of vaccine hesitancy, what I wanna touch on is its history, how this is rooted in some respects from competing goods, um, the idea of free riding on herd immunity, <clears throat> I wanna spend a chunk of time on the issues of numeracy, science literacy, and how we communicate science to the general public. And then I wanna finish on this part with, uh, with some of the psychological roots. So this is nothing new, right? The, the, the vaccine hesitancy is nothing new. Uh, historically, you can see in the bottom here, this is a cartoon and a publication of the Anti-Vaccine Society in 1808. So no sooner did Edward Jenner's vaccine uh, um, come into the scene in the late, eight, uh, late 1700s 
which was derived from the cowpox virus, a, a kind of cousin to smallpox. Um, uh, and people were, you know, making these cartoons of like, he's going to turn us into cows or growing cow parts out of our body, you know, kind of like we're changing your DNA now with the COVID vaccine, right? Um, a few decades later, you see this book, 150 Reasons for Disobeying the Vaccination Law by persons prosecuted under it. So uh, we've got the victims of the kind of mandates back in the um, uh, eight, uh, late 1800s. Um, I think we have to recognize that some of the, the issues here are that the, the conflicts and the hesitancy is often um, rooted in true competing goods. All of us to uh, one degree or another value the ideas of personal liberty, autonomy, the new buzzword now on this side is health freedom. The idea that I get to say what goes into my body, what happens to my body, I think resonates with most of us and most of us would think this is important. <clears throat> uh, kind of on the other side of that equation are the ideas of the common good, solidarity with one another, public health goals. And I think all of us would agree those can be important too. And they are often in tension with each other. And they often mean one side giving uh, sway to the other to achieve uh, a, a balance of these. And we can also see uh, that we have party affiliations and we have um, uh, countries even that may skew one way or the other on these, emphasizing extremes of you know, only the common good or extremes of only um, uh, personal liberty or autonomy. The other issue that I think uh, happens with this is, I think this is, this is for the most part subconscious, it may be conscious, but I've kind of alluded to the idea of herd immunity. And this is the idea, uh, you know, my little metaphor, I don't know what these things are, muskox or something, I'm not sure what they are. Um, that, that if you have enough people immune, <clears throat> um, that the, the people who can't take a vaccine because of their age or they're immunosuppressed or they don't respond to the vaccine are protected by the rest of us. But if you have enough muskox saying, you know, I don't want to hold the line here. I'm going to let the rest of the mus muskox do it. You know, I think we got enough for the saber-toothed tiger and one leaves and then another leaves and then another leaves. And you have a porous line that allows predators to get in. And the same thing holds for vaccination. Um, and this is the idea of what's called free riding. That's, you know, whether it's conscious or subconscious, I'm going to let the rest of the people do this. Uh, why should I take the risks of the vaccine. I've never seen measles. I've never seen polio. I've never seen uh, diphtheria. <laughs> um, and, it, and so far, it seems like it's not getting in here. But of course, if enough of us make that choice, then it can uh, spread. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the cognitive issues and some of the um, uh, issues with numeracy and science literacy. Uh, a book that uh, helps me, oops, uh, help me on this is, I didn't mean to pull that up yet, is this book, um, Innumeracy, Mathematical Illiteracy and Its Consequences by John Paulus. He looks at like uh, our, our society in the United States in particular, and, and as a general population, it's facility with numbers. And it's not a pretty sight. <laughs> like, um, there's been a lot of talk about mathematical illiteracy for some time and a lot of educators trying to address that. But it's a substantial issue, and this is not to disparage the general population. It's just something we have to understand and work with and recognize. Um, a, a little test that came out of this is something called the Schwartz Numeracy Test, which asks three questions. If you uh, fair coin toss uh, a, a coin a thousand times, how many times will it come up heads? 46% of people will answer that question incorrectly. <laughs> Similarly, if you ask the general population to convert 1% to a proportion of 1,000, Again, about 46% can't answer that question correctly. If you go the opposite direction and ask them to convert one out of a thousand to a percentage, about 80% can't do that. Think about that when you think about all the data. People like me are trying to talk about, you know, the general public and, you know, on vaccine risk, on safety, efficacy, risks of the virus, proportions, ratios, rates, et cetera. Um, how much are people really understanding or getting? Um, Next, I think, is the issue of the challenges of causality. Uh, so our brains are literally hardwired to make causal associations. Something bad happens to us, we want to know why. 
what happened before this bad thing that happened to me? I don't want that to happen to me again. I don't want it to happen to my family. We all do this. We're evolutionarily hardwired to do this. I use the example of Jenny McCarthy. Jenny McCarthy was a Playboy model, then a B-movie actress, and then a, um, a talk show host. Um, and her son, Dylan, uh, was diagnosed maybe with autism, some other, or it's not clear if it was some other developmental problem, but, um, and she's, she believes it was a vaccine that caused that. And she's been sort of on a crusade for a while when she was partnered up with Jim Carrey, the actor, they were doing this together. <clears throat> and one of her kind of, uh, you know, uh, famous lines is, he was vaccinated and something changed. My son is my science. And I, I regularly use this example and I ask my students in my class, is Jenny McCarthy's observation and conclusion unreasonable? And my students who know I run a center for immunization research and education squirm in their chair and like, they're like, well, it seems kind of reasonable, but it must be unreasonable because she's anti-vaccine. And I say, it's a, of course, this is reasonable. Any reasonable person would do this and try and understand what happened. My son seemed to be developing okay and something changed. He was vaccinated a week ago, a month ago, three months ago. <clears throat> the problem is, is that this is the, the, it's a reasonable thing to ask. It absolutely does not answer the question. Um, this is fraught with all kinds of misattributions and potential problems, right? There's another example. This is from the website covidvaccineinjuries.com. And you see, you know, this 42-year-old Brazilian journalist dies following a, of, of a heart attack following vaccination. Um, I looked at this particular case. It was nine months after his vaccine, which, you know, kind of begs the question, was it really the vaccine? But um, here's the problem with this kind of inference. <clears throat> um, so he's 42 and you think, well, uh, you know, he didn't have any heart problems before, but on any given day in America, this is what happens before any COVID vaccine. Any given day in America, we have about 22 people having a heart attack, about 2,500 people will have a blood clot, another 2,200 will have a stroke, about 4,900 people will be diagnosed with cancer, and about 8,000 people will die any and every given day in the United States. We vaccinated over 200 million people in a matter of a few months. <clears throat> Uh, got up to almost 60% of the population in less than a year. 8,000 of those people, uh, not, not that total population, but whatever the relative percentage of that 60%, you know, were going, that, that were going to die, still are going to die or have a stroke or have a heart attack or have a blood clot. That's the background noise on, of what's happening. So when, when somebody says, well, it had to be the vaccine, you, I have to, and I'll tell you, I got emails like, you can't believe, like, you know, I'm not taking that vaccine. My aunt had a heart attack a month after the vaccine, to which I say, that's noteworthy. We should report that to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. It's a concern, but you can't actually make much of an inference other than, hmm, I wonder if that could have been from the vaccine. These inferences, these causal inferences, don't answer the question. They ask the question, which has to be answered with higher quality studies. <clears throat> Here's another type of study that's frequently trotted out. I was sent many of these uh, over the last couple of years. Um, this was a study that looked at cumulative mercury exposure in childhood vaccines in 19 to 35 month olds. Mercury is a, was a preservative in, child, uh, in many of our vaccines. It's been removed from all childhood vaccines, so it's not an issue anymore. And by the way, autism rates didn't fall when that all got removed from every pediatric vaccine. But um, this had been going up, and then they laid on top of that a, a graph of autism rates in California at that same period of time. And you see these correlate. These seem to run together. It's, not, it's understandable why somebody might say, hmm, are mercury preservatives and vaccines causing autism? The problem with this is this is what's called an ecological study. It's, that doesn't mean it's like the environment. The, these are studies that look at trends in populations. And it's prone to what's called the ecological fallacy, which is attributing um, trends in groups to things that are happening to individuals. That study did not look at, did the kids that received a mercury preservative vaccine actually, were they the ones that got autism? These are similar studies that ask a question, they never answer a question. It's okay to ask the question. And I could show you 
there's a delicious website uh, of a guy who makes all kinds of spurious associate, ridiculous spurious associations that are statistically correlated um, and, and, and are beyond you know, all credibility. Um, and so these ask questions, they don't answer. So the problem is when, when we look at these cases, case series, each ecological studies, and we try and draw some kind of conclusions from them, all of them lack one critical thing that helps us get closer to making causal inferences. They lack a control group. And I will tell you, if we have uh, students graduating from college who took a science course and can't look at those, re those claims that were just made there and go, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder what would happen if they did this with a control group. We have failed to teach science. I would say we failed if we don't do that in high school, and we probably failed to do it if we don't do it in middle school. And I'll get to something at the end that shows that we can actually accomplish this. But <clears throat> um, this is just one of many fundamental principles of the scientific method, that if we have a broad population that is saying, you know, a heart attack happened three weeks after this vaccine, it must be the vaccine, and not recognizing that now we have studies with hundreds of thousands of people where we looked at heart attacks in the vaccinated, heart attacks in the unvaccinated, and there's no differences, that that absolutely trumps and obliterates you know, that, that one anecdote, then we've really failed. The other issue is how we talk about science. Um, and a lot of times we're speaking different languages. I use the, the example of what's called the black swan dilemma uh, when I teach in class. The black swan dilemma says, you know, I've got a hypothesis. My hypothesis is all swans are white. <clears throat> well, how can I know all swans are white? Well, I start studying a sample of swans. Uh, I've, I've looked at a thousand swans, all of them are white. Can I now say all swans are white? No, of course not. Well, I, I look at more and more swans. I get a greater and greater sample. But I can never get to where I say, oops, uh, I can never get to where I say, sorry about that, Ooh, man back to that one. I can never get to where I say, I now know that all swans are white. I mean, scientists won't do that. They won't do that. Um, so when you have, like what happened here on the daytime television show of the doctors, Jenny McCarthy sitting next to an NIH scientist having a debate on whether vaccines cause autism. And Jenny McCarthy turns to the NIH scientist and said, can you tell me with 100% certainty that you know vaccines do not cause autism? And the NIH scientist kind of squirms and goes, well, we have studies that have looked at hundreds of thousands of children and we can't find any associate, but you won't say, you know, they don't cause autism. And it looks like an equal debate with Jenny McCarthy actually sounding a little bit better because she's not so uncertain because <clears throat> she's certain that it caused her son's change. And they don't, they aren't speaking the same language. Um, I, I look at examples like this. This is actually one of my slides. I'm using it as an example of ineffective science communication. This is a slide of uh, vaccine effectiveness for various COVID conditions in Israel. Imagine putting that out to the general public with what I just showed you about numeracy and numerical uh, and innumeracy and having somebody try and make sense of what vaccine effectiveness is for these different things, 39, 40, 88, 91%. I was asked on a radio show uh, Dr. Carson, can you define vaccine effectiveness for us? And I went, sure. And I, and I was trying to think, uh, how do I explain this? To, and I went, uh, uh, well, it's like this many less in this population compared to, you know, I can give you the formula. I can drive this. I can, you know, do this in my sleep. But when I tried to explain it in a way that I thought would be intelligible to the, to the radio audience, I floundered. <clears throat> um, there's some research that suggests doing things like this is a better way. Um, this is uh, what Sanford put out. They put it out on billboards and they put it on their internal uh, social media. This was the number of people in the hospital, the ICU or on a ventilator who were unvaccinated in red or vaccinated in white. It's this visual sort of intuitive in your face appearance that most people go, wow, there's a lot of red there. So when I come and I show this and I say, you know, as far as we're concerned in healthcare, this really looks to be a pandemic, at least in the hospital, a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Uh, you know, that, that kind of helps. We have to figure out how to do this better in, in a lot of different ways in communicating science. The other issue that we struggle with is that I think a lot of the general public see science as like, you do your thing, you do your experiments, you do your studies, and now you, you hit truth. 
we've got the truth. And of course, we know that doesn't, it's not how it works. It's this sort of slow progress that approximates truth. And I, you're, you'll be hard pressed to ever hear somebody in science say, it's settled. We now know the science, we're done. I mean, we just don't do that, right? And in fact, it's messier than that. My son was appalled at my oscillating curve here and, and my freehand oscillating curve. And he's an engineer and just, he said, you have to change that, Dad. Um, but, you know, this is more how it moves. It goes up and down and up. And, I mean, you, you, you know, a scientific proposition is put out. It's challenged by another group. You know, I mean, just think about like, is butter good for you or bad for you? Well, it's up and then it's down and then it's up again. And I'm really glad it seems to be moving towards eggs and butter are good because I really want to just have that. But we never say it's sort of settled science. <clears throat> Look at just a, a real world example here. At the beginning of the pandemic, Dr. Fauci, well, I'm not beating up on it all because this was me at the beginning of the pandemic too. He's, he's asked here, uh, you know, what about masks for the general public? And he said, there's no reason to be walking around with a mask. Six months later, the head of the CDC says, masks are more guaranteed to work than a vaccine. That's six months later. Um, up, down, up, down, right? <laughs> um, and both of these are hyperbolic statements that actually I think we can do better in the way we communicate science. And I'll get to that at the end. Um, they, they, I think they could have communicated this much better. <laughs> um, but I like this quote by this Dr. David Brosh. He's a psychologist in this article that he wrote. And he says, uh, um, the capacity for self-correction is the source of science's immense strength. <laughs> but the public is unnerved by the fact that scientific wisdom isn't immutable Scientific knowledge changes with great speed and frequency as it should, yet the public opinion drags with reluctance to be modified once established. And the rapid ebb and flow of scientific wisdom has left many people uh, feeling jerked around, confused, and increasingly resistant to science itself. This is a real problem for us, <clears throat> a, a real problem. And we, we see this a lot, right? We see, I mean, I think this is in 2015. I think this is you hear this a great deal now. I say that, you know, the scientific method is a little bit like sausage being made. Sorry, you know, I know it's meant to revile, right? So, um, so you know, it's, it's not a real pretty process sometimes. And the curtain's been pulled back on what science has been doing in a way that I don't think has ever been seen in, in history before. People are getting to look at the sausage. I mean, we have non-peer reviewed preprints being put out on Twitter um, as soon as they're put out and then challenged and re-challenged and re-challenged. <clears throat> so people are getting to look at the sausage. But I, I remind you that at the end of that can be something as sublime as the sausage made by those Germans in Napoleon. Um, I don't have any stock in the Schmidt Walker, but like it's fabulous stuff. Um, and sublime, as sublime as vaccines and drugs brought to us in record time that have a 90% chance of keeping you out of the hospital or dying but it wasn't a pretty process getting there. Uh, just a little bit about the psychological roots. <clears throat> uh, a, a big part of this is what uh, is, it stems from what we call confirmation bias. You know, the, it, uh, the in investor Warren Buffett, you know, and a, uh, not a scientist, but a keen observer of people says what the human being is best at doing is interpreting all new information so that their prior conclusions remain intact, right? We're more comfortable with comforting lies and unpleasant truths. I like this little graphic of some of the different biases that are at the psychological roots of things like vaccine hesitancy. Biases in what are called heuristics, which are quick rule of thumb kind of thinking, rapid ways our brain has evolved with good reason to help us make quick decisions, but often not very accurate ones when it comes to challenging problems like uh, risk benefit analysis of a vaccine or a virus. So you have confirmation bias. We cherry pick evidence that backs up what we already know. The backfire effect, this is a big one. When we are faced with conflicting evidence, the brain defends existing beliefs like a fortress. You can actually show this on functional MRI scans, the way the brain lights up when you challenge somebody with a deep seated existing belief. It tamps down the prefrontal cortex, the rational part of our brain, lights up the limbic system, our fight or flight system, and, and draws on memories that are really stuck in there, very hard to change. Um, we have what's called groupthink. Our opinions frequently become symbols of belonging to our respective groups. 
and our brains then work to protect our group's worldview. <clears throat> we have what's called the availability heuristic, conclusions based on one vivid example. My aunt had a heart attack two weeks after a vaccine. That, that just obliterates all other examples and it obliterates even like, let me show you this study and this study and this study. I, I saw my aunt, um, you're not changing my mind. The affect heuristic uh, that feelings tend to trump facts. <clears throat> Feelings, there's actually quite a bit of evidence that shows that when we have feeling associated decisions made, um, they really override uh, the rational part of our brain. And think of what happens when you amplify this with social media. Social media is now, if you haven't watched The Social Dilemma, the documentary on social media, I highly encourage you to do it. I mean, the, the, these media are designed to play on all of these heuristics, confirmation biases, <coughs> other biases, and drill us down into rabbit holes that are uh, of like-minded people. You, you liked this, you shared this, I think you're gonna like this and this and this and this. And off we go into our own echo chambers and rabbit holes. You're, you people in this audience are for the most part educated, smart, <clears throat> you have graduate degrees. If I pulled this audience and asked, do you think you're below average, average or above average in your ability to be objective when faced with various information? I suspect most of us would probably say we're above average. We're all Lake Wobegon here. Um, if you wanna have that notion challenged, I highly encourage you to watch this TED talk by Dan Kahan. He's a Yale behavioral economist who's done a huge body of very elegant research that unveils just how badly all of us engage in these confirmation biases and strikingly how educated and more numerate people are better at using the rational part of their brain to justify their cognitive biases and their preexisting notions. Uh, it's, and he has the provocative title, are smart people ruining democracy? Look at his studies and his research. I've read a number of his papers. They're, they're very clever experiments that unveil how much we all do this. Uh, Polarization, I, you would not have thought I, that, have, at least I would not have initially thought a virus which threatens everybody would be uh, something that may polarize us, <clears throat> but it certainly did. I don't have the answers to this. I have one little piece of speculation on at least part of the problem. So you had, uh, I think, our political figure, figure starting to weigh in on things that really were more matters of kind of science and public health debate. And I give a few examples here. You know, President Trump early on said it's going to disappear early in the ap epidemic. We didn't know. I mean, he can toss that out there, but this was probably better to be speculated on, you know, uh, uh, infectious disease epidemiologists. And even that, I, you know, I got a lot of these things wrong. Um, you had a physician who was a legislator over in Minnesota, Western Minnesota, putting out there that COVID-19 deaths are being inflated. And he got picked up on conservative media, he was on Fox News multiple times. He became, he got invited to all kinds of uh, big speaking events. We actually have pretty good data that the opposite is true, but um, it, this is a proposition put out there, um, primarily in a partisan uh, media. We had talking heads on, you know, uh, conservative media outlets saying it's no worse than the flu. Um, President Trump weighing in on the hydroxychloroquine debate early on, you know, I, this is going to be a game changer, et cetera. So the problem was when, when, when data started coming in that these things aren't right, like it's certainly not gonna end in, in a few months. Hydroxychloroquine, we're at 12 or 13 randomized controlled trials showing no benefit. You know, it, it's way worse than the flu, like lots of data. But this was a partisan flag, if you will. Think about what I just talked about, you know, the group think, defending my ideas with a fortress, keeping my group identity. Um, you know, not to be outdone on the other side, you had Nancy Pelosi early on saying, go visit Chinatown, have a meal there, shop. And her goal, I think, was, you know, understandable. she wanted to tamp down the anti-Asian bias that was starting to bubble up. But this wasn't a very good public health uh, recommendation because it probably was coming in from China, at least initially. <clears throat> um, you had uh, Kamala Harris, uh, when asked about the vaccine, saying, I mean, she made a political statement. I won't take his word for it, meaning President Trump. If President Trump's advocating the vaccine, I'm not going to take his word for it. I mean, it would have been good if she could have talked about like what the scientists were saying instead of taking a political pot shot, but it planted a flag, if you will. I think one of the things that probably hurt us the most was when we had a lot of public health people um, condemning the um, 
protests, primarily in Michigan and some other states, um, against uh, vac- against um, uh, lockdowns and mask mandates, saying these are going to be COVID super spreader events uh, from a public health perspective. You shouldn't be doing this. And then right after that, I mean, literally right after that, saying, yeah, uh, but, you know, um, don't shut down our protests uh, in the wake of the George Floyd killing, uh, Black Lives Matters protests, because though that's more important than actually the coronavirus prevention. So this is a real uh, mixed message that are that are I think at their root uh, roots uh, politically uh, driven, um, and and it really made a lot of people you know thousand public health and medical professionals signing a letter on this it made it re- it just really looked hypocritical, and we settled into our respective tribes because these are symbols of the flags of where we belong and so on and off we go, <clears throat> and this has had real effects. I mean this is a P- recent Pew uh, Research Center uh, looking at. Um, percentage of U.S. adults who have, you know, a fair amount, a great deal, or not much at all confidence in, I chose the, their survey on medical scientists, and you can see the, you know, significant drop along partisan lines, particularly here, so particularly amongst um, people who identify uh, with the Republican Party, it is we've had this huge erosion of uh, confidence or trust. Um, just a word about conspiracy theories. Um, Paul Offutt, a vaccine researcher, says, you know, that we've seen a lot of these conspiracy theories coming out, that they create, they, they, they're attracted because they create order out of chaos. A, a little more in-depth analysis is uh, in this book, uh, Denying to the Grave, which I, I found very helpful. And they say the research on this shows that, you know, it emerges typically where there's knowledge gaps and uncertainty, feelings of powerlessness. And now I'm in a group that actually sees what the sheeple aren't seeing, right? Like, I'm in a group that has special knowledge, so I'm empowered. Um, often happens, oops, sorry, often happens in uh, politicized or polarized issues. We've talked about that. And often when a charismatic leader steps in with, with, the, with the answer. Um, I could talk, do a whole talk on that. We don't have time. <clears throat> I want to finish with what I think are some of the lessons uh, I've taken from this and how some of those lessons I think might have applicability to the greater university. A lot of what I want to say here is um, from a talk <clears throat> by Dr. Peter Sandman, which was to a large group of public health professionals <clears throat> several months ago. Dr. Sandman is an expert on uh, risk communication. And I want to start this by saying, first, I have a lot of my public health colleagues here who like worked really hard these last two years, long hours, tirelessly beat to heck by the public and all kinds of places. And so this is not to disparage their work in any way or shape or all, at all. But I'm gonna talk about how I, some things that I think we could have gotten better. And I put me, me in particular in this bucket here. And Dr. Sandman said to our group, I listened into this webinar, he said, you know, you're calling me to address you because your trust is low. People don't trust you anymore, CDC, public health, uh, um, even you doctors. Your trust is low. Well, the first thing you need to look at when trust is low is your own behavior, which is the only thing we have control over, really. And he outlined uh, in his talk, eight things U.S. pandemic communicators get wrong. And his subtitle was, and you're still getting wrong. Um, Number one was he said, overconfidence and failure to proclaim uncertainty. I showed you at the beginning, Dr. Fauci saying, you don't need to be wearing this mask, pretty confidently. Six months later, Dr. Redfield saying, it's going to be better than a vaccine, pretty confident. We're, we still don't really know just what degree masks uh, work, um, you know, what their level of efficacy is. It's unsettled science. <clears throat> we should have acknowledged that. Um, we should have acknowledged the uncertainty around this. We want to speak confidently because we want people's behavior to change. And we may get a short-term gain for a long-term loss uh, in doing this failure to do anticipatory guidance. I'm guilty. Like when the vaccine first came out and it was 95% efficacy against symptomatic infection, I was like, this is fantastic. But I knew in the back of my brain that like that efficacy could decline over time, that variants might make it so it doesn't work nearly as well. <clears throat> if we would have spoken to, this is great, but hold on. We don't know what's going to happen here in the future. This may really Uh, change. We're going to have to wait and see. Let's see how the data comes in. But we wanted people to take the vaccine. We said with great confidence, uh, take this, and we didn't do anticipatory guidance. 
we sometimes, I, this is the one I thought Dr. Sandman's was the weakest, but I, I think he has a point. He said, we spoke like there was consensus on a lot of things when there really wasn't consensus. The science says. Um, and sometimes the scientific community was divided. Like on mask efficacy, there was a minority voice saying, we don't know that these do much. There was a minority voice of legitimate people saying, we think lockdowns are more deleterious than uh, what they prevent. I, I don't agree with how they, they, they came to some of their conclusions. They kind of, this is the great Barrington Declaration. Some of you may remember that, um, which was construed as focus protection, otherwise kind of let it rip, if you will. Um, but they weren't misinformation brokers. <clears throat> they were a legitimate minority voice. Prioritizing health over all goods. I mean, uh, in public health, we really thought this pandemic was front and center and first and foremost. But to be fair, there are other values uh, when you talk about lockdowns and effects on people's jobs and livelihoods and the economy and so on and the mental health effects of those sorts of things. There are other competing values that other people deserve to be at the table to weigh in on. It's not just public health or health care. <clears throat> this one kind of hurt, uh, is prioritizing health over truth. And uh, he talked about uh, the, the examples of, now I'm not beating up on Dr. Fauci, who I think has an exemplary career in public health and, and science. And, but he used the example of where Dr. Fauci um, was asked what we needed for herd immunity. And at the early part of the pandemic, we thought it was around 60 to 70%. And he said, I think it's 85%. And he was later asked, like, well, why'd you come to that? All the other experts are saying 60 to 70%. He goes, well, I didn't think we'd get to 60 to 70%. So I put the number higher to kind of, you know, goose, goose the population and take the vaccine. Short-term gain for long-term loss. <clears throat> um, failure to own our own mistakes. Uh, I've, I'll give you a success that I had here after initial failure. Early on, you know, there was a lot of talk about vaccine versus natural immunity, vaccine versus natural immunity. We were kind of feeling compelled to not talk too much about natural immunity because we wanted people to take the vaccine, which we thought was the best thing. But we knew from other diseases that natural immunity is frequently quite good at preventing subsequent infection. And the data was coming in that it was about as good as two doses of the vaccine. I had a guy who was emailing me regularly after every state webinar I did saying, you know, questioning everything I said, questioning everything I did. And why won't you talk about natural immunity? And I had in that webinar, I said, did you look at 39 minutes? I, I addressed that. And I said, yeah, there's something here. We should probably be paying attention to this. Totally changed our conversation. Totally. Like I became much more credible to him. And I said, you know, I think we were mistaken in not owning up to that uh, earlier on. And then failure to in address information credibly and empathetically. One of my failures here uh, was a family member who was having a real hard time with a decision about making the, uh, taking the vaccine. We had had ongoing conversations. This is a very uh, you know dear close family member of mine, and um, this per person uh, was moving more towards wanting to take the vaccine, and then brought up to me. He said, "Have you read this stuff by Dr. Malone?" the inventor of the mRNA vaccine. Now this guy did some science in the eighties, was disgruntled that he wasn't called the inventor of the mRNA vaccine. Um, he's, and he, he actually took the vaccine, but then has now gone out and saying it's toxin, it's gonna hurt you, it's gonna cause all these problems. And he's, he's the darling of a, a lot of uh, uh, media. And I said to this family member, that guy's a quack. And I, I lost my family member when I said that. Like this family member later told me, I couldn't trust what you were saying anymore, Paul, because um, this person isn't a quack and he wasn't a quack. Um, and I didn't do the hard work of empathetically and credibly countering all this stuff this guy was saying, which was gonna take a long time and I'd have to look up some more stuff and, um, and I failed. <clears throat> and then the politicization, Dr. Sandman, this is one I'm, you know, I, I think is to me, one of the most difficult to kind of consider how, you, you know, what he said here, but he said, you know, you guys in public health, you're kind of viewed as sort of lefty, that you, 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 you know, most of you are, are viewed as kind of being on the more liberal side of, of politics. He said, I look forward to the day when you work as hard appropriately to try and assure um, cultural, ethnic, racial diversity, equity into your programs as you do intellectual diversity. 
And I'm not exactly sure how you do that, but it was a challenge that uh, made me stop and think a little bit. <laughs> um, and I think these issues are not just public health. These are, I think, can be cast on the acad you know, academia as well. This is confidence. This is also um, Gallup poll looking at confidence in higher ed, trust in higher ed book uh, from a few years ago on the death of expertise. We are not viewed as that credible by a large portion of the population, particularly along partisan lines. Um, so the, I'm finishing here, I'm sorry. It's like a couple minutes over, we're really almost done. The lessons learned here, like Winston Churchill says, never let a good crisis go to waste. We have seen this pandemic breakdown silos. I've never seen healthcare and public health working better together ever in my history. A lot of the silos have been broken down. We, I think, need better research and efforts on communication of science to the public. We need our marketing colleagues and our communication colleagues to help us figure out how to quit being dumb nerds and the way we talk about this stuff um, so that it's intelligible to the general public. We need to teach, I think, um, much more rigorously how to recognize our own cognitive biases and research on what works to overcome those. There is some research. People who talk to people from um, opposing views tend to really do this much better, we are able to tamp down their cognitive biases much better. How much do we do that? Talk to people with, from you know, across the fence. <clears throat> Rebuilding trust in academia, public health, and the health professions by not doing all of those things that Peter Sandman said we were doing in public health that causes erosion of trust. And I think we need a serious examination of mathematical and scientific literacy in, in immunizing, if you will, the next generation against misinformation. And I actually think that there's some hope here. And this, was, this, this is the last big jump on the moving upstream metaphor, <clears throat> which it's taken me a long time to sort of get to this point. If we're trying to get doctors to change the way they have a conversation in the, the clinic, if we're trying to counter misinformation and conspiracy theories on social media, We've, we've kind of already lost. I mean, that's, that's really hard stuff to change. Um, but there's, a, there's some research now that's starting to emerge from this group uh, called the Informed Health Choices led by Dr. Andrew Oxman, a public health physician in Norway. They have a big partnership with Uganda. And they've been actually researching, <clears throat> can you teach kids as young as 10 years old how to recognize bogus health claims? not bogus, but weak, weak health claims. They are able to teach kids as young as 10, like, wait a minute, you don't have a control group. Wait a minute, you, you, you've got like this bias uh, built into, in, into the, what you're just putting out there. And it works. They're able to show that these kids, even a year out from a, a curriculum they've developed, are pretty good at having a really good baloney de detector or another B word detector um, uh, on on poor health claims, weak, weak health or hazard claims. And that could extrapolate beyond healthcare. Sorry, I went over. I'll fit, stop there and I'd be happy to take any questions. Maybe we can, and I'm happy to take them at the uh, reception afterwards since we went a little bit over time, but maybe one or two from the audience and from Zoom if there are any, um, and then we can talk more afterwards. But thank you for your time and attention. Any questions? Okay, uh, we're gonna take the ones in-house first and if there aren't any here, we'll move to Zoom and Kylie's got those on Zoom for me. Um, any any questions in, in house here first? Yes. Just a, just a comment. So yeah. Yeah. His, his favorite example was pay more people are killed every year by fake medical doctors. Right. Or dog bites. Yeah. And so I, I sometimes wonder if you struggle with this, you have a populace out there who isn't very good at discussing. Right. Data. Right. And so they, they look at this one in 1,000 chance that they're a vaccine related issue right. versus their real risk. Autism or whatever, or the, yeah, the, the risks of the disease, which there aren't really any risks as long as we kind of maintain herd immunity threshold. So, you know, that's a problem. But you're right. This, and there's actually a whole body of research, like looking like how can we better display risk assessment? 
I was just reading some stuff just yesterday on this and trying to frame it with other things people know a little more intimately or immediately, but that's a great, great point. Um, any other questions in house before me? Yes, Todd. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to re, uh, try and restate the question because not everybody could hear, I'm sure, for the um, people who are on Zoom. I think the question was, did I personally feel pressure to maybe uh, underplay vaccine risk or overstate efficacy? Yeah. Yeah. So um, what I would say to answer that question is I didn't, I didn't have anybody breathing down my back saying, yeah. So um, did I feel pressure to, uh, I wish I had you here, you know, what I'm going to. I mean, you've got questions on how much take the mic around, but I think um, for this next question. Um, right. To, to, um, I, th I think it's that overconfidence question to overconfidently state things about the vaccine um, in view of what we were seeing in the country with vaccine hesitancy and so on. Um, there wasn't any like sitting in a smoke filled room, like, you know, uh, you know, should we state this inaccurately? There was, I think I felt pressure to get people vaccinated, like in a hurry, because it was sweeping through in waves. And so I, I, I felt internally a, a des great desire to like, uh, you know, confidently say you, you should get this vaccine. I firmly believe the best thing for the vast majority of the population was to take the vaccine. I think that did come out then in ways of like not uh, addressing um, uncertainty, not addressing anticipatory guidance, like this could change, this, this might fall. I, so it was an internal pressure, not something external, I would say. Oh. Any Zoom questions, Kyrie? All right. So the question was, are there control groups for vaccine trials or are there only control groups um, once the vaccine is out and released? There are absolutely control groups for vaccine trials. That's the only way they can get to licensure. Um, and they're, they're the best of design studies because it's usually either a placebo or whatever the standard of care is. The problem with the vaccine trials are that you're, they're, they're extremely hard to do. They're very expensive. They're very uh, time consuming. And, and and the, the FDA and the manufacturers are trying to just uh, reach the threshold of proof of efficacy or that they're better than placebo or better, what, better than the control group. That usually means thousands to maybe tens of thousands of people in the, in the uh, study that will not identify problems with vaccines that may be one out of 100,000 or one out of a million. The only way you can do that is after it's out in wider circulation. Um, and you do what are called observational studies then to, to find those much rarer side effects. I need to. We have no more questions on the webinar. Any more from any of you here? All right. Thank you very much. Let's thank Dr. Carson.